Welcome everybody to the Wednesday Vegetable and Berry Grower webinar. Today's talks are on managing aphids in winter greens and tunnels and also managing diseases on that crop. And we're going to start with Cheryl Sullivan from UVM and then Ann Hazelrig will follow her. Probably best to hold your verbal questions till the end of the talks. Feel free to type them in the chat as we go and there should be plenty of time for questions after the presentations. Take it away, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all excited to hear about managing aphids. Uh, at one time, thrips were considered one of the key pests um, that growers struggled with, but nowadays it seems to be all about the aphids. And why is this not working? Oh, there we go. All right, so much of what I'm gonna talk about as briefly as possible are strategies to consider that could help you prevent the dreaded aphid apocalypse. I hope that you will take away some new ideas or tweak some of your existing management practices so you can reduce your chances of facing an outbreak. So a little bit about aphids in general, they're soft body bugs that have piercing sucky mouth parts that they use to feed on the sap. So as a result of that, they cause distortions, stunting, and they can transmit viruses, and their sticky honeydew that they excrete can cause a lot of mole growth. So they can have extremely high population growth rates, which I'll discuss later, which allows for management challenges, and washing them for produce is often labor intensive, and there's really few options out there organically, um, or really biologically at all, to combat them during an already challenging time of year. So to successfully battle aphids or any pest for that matter, you need to know a bit about their biology. This is important when using biocontrols as well as pesticides because both, both will often target a particular life stage during their development. So some questions to consider uh, relate to their appearance, recognizing their damage, the time of year they show up, and what uh, crop varieties are most prone to their infestation. So aphids have non, oh, why is it not working? Aphids have, oh, there we go. Okay, so aphids have winged and non-winged um, adult forms. The immatures and nymphs, they don't have wings, but both adults and nymphs cause uh, damages. Uh, aphids can be extremely challenging to identify, even for us experts. Uh, some of the features that we use to ID them primarily relate to their head shape from their antennal tubercles um, and their length uh, and the texture of their cornicles. And those are the tailpipe or stovepipe looking protrusions on their rear ends. Color is not really used much for ID because aphids can take on many different color morphs. So a lot of times you can have one population on one plant variety that's one shade and another somewhere else in a different location, a completely different shade. So it's recommended that aphids be identified uh, if you're gonna use biocontrol because many uh, parasitic wasps will only attack a certain species of aphid. If you're going to send an aphid to the diagnostic clinic to be identified, it's great if you could collect as many of the biggest ones as possible to send because it's almost impossible to get a definitive identification on a lot of the smaller uh, immatures. All right, so the most common aphid that we see on greens is the green peach aphid, uh, primarily, and sometimes the foxglove aphid. Sometimes potato aphid observed, but that's usually following infestations from summer crops, uh, especially tomatoes. Uh, foxglove aphids tend to do better in cooler temperatures and um, has no problem whatsoever overwintering in tunnels, especially on weeds. Out west in field crops, uh, the lettuce and lettuce root aphid actually cause massive losses, but we don't really see much of them at all around here. And some of the telltale signs you have aphids are the obvious distortion uh, when populations get really high. Um, also when they're high, their sticky honeydew excretions can coat surfaces and allow for the mold growth. The cast skins um, are also one of the first signs of an infestation. They leave these behind as they molt between different life stages. 
And sometimes these skins are mistaken for white flies because they can flutter away so easily when disturbed. My computer is being so strange right now. All right, so where do aphids come from? They don't just magically appear. Um, usually they have a reason for being there, like hitchhiking in on new plant material, or they often fly in from outside, uh, weeds both inside and out. And one of the biggest reasons aphids continue to be a problem is because they carry over from previous crops. All right, so high tunnels provide a wonderful environment for aphids to persist, especially if populations are left unchecked during continuous year-round production. A lot of this has to do with their general life cycle, which can be really complicated as this diagram shows. So I'm gonna use a green peach aphid as an example of this because it's the most common aphid we see um, and it's focused on that orange circle on the left. As far as appearances go, the immatures or nymphs, uh, they look very similar in appearance to the non-winged adults. And aphids will actually undergo several nymph stages before becoming mature. So under year round high tunnel production, uh, in summer, in warmer climates, uh, reproduction is parthenogenic, where the females don't need to mate uh, to reproduce. They just produce little clones, and they keep on clone making until they become so crowded they grow wings and migrate or disperse new areas in crops, like in your high tunnel. Uh, this can be very, this can happen really quickly, like as little as 10 to 12 days for a complete generation when temperatures are really warm. So when you remove these hosts um, or um, the hosts begin to die with the onset of like colder winters, the green peach aphid will switch to needing males again. So now we're flying out of that little orange circle. So they'll start making males and then they'll seek out uh, prunus species to lay their eggs on for overwintering. So what happens is in the spring, all these eggs hatch and then clone making resumes. And after a few generations, the populations build up. So the females disperse to new host plants like greenhouses, high tunnels, and whatever field crops are are around. So now that uh, you're experts in aphid bio 101, um, it gets down to prevention as the first line of defense against this aphid attack. So we need to break up their life cycle um, or in order to reduce the odds of populations becoming established in the first place. So some of the key strategies are scouting and monitoring. Um, you want to train all your personnel what the aphids look like. Uh, avoid rotating crops into already um, infested tunnels. You want to inspect incoming plant material. Fallowing is also a great idea. Screening, that's kind of a double-edged sword, uh, keeps natural enemies out um, as well as the pests, but it can also keep natural enemies and stuff in. So it's kind of a weird uh, dynamic there. Uh, managing weeds inside and out, um, weed-free zones, um, wider, the better. Removing debris from previous previous cropping cycle, it's really good to get a lot of that out of there, especially if it was infested. And spot spraying or roguing uh, infested plants, and also the use of biocontrols as a preventative early on is also a a good option. So here's an example of a looming problem. No worries, this is an image from a location that's not in Vermont. Um, so the seasonal timing is kind of reversed on this, but the concept is still the same. This particular operation had a major infestation on their late winter greens that was left unchecked. So when they transition gradually into crops to peppers and tomatoes, the aphids just jump ship and they continue to battle aphids all summer on the transplanted crops. Uh, furthermore, the weeds along the edges acted as an additional host for the aphids, for different aphid species. Um, another example that I can think of is a grower who had a massive outbreak on their greens. And after a thorough removal of all the infested debris, uh, a layer of wheat cloth, uh, tomatoes were transplanted. So within a week, the tomatoes were completely infested with aphids. And one well-timed spray of Pyganic followed by a few releases of aphidious wasps cleaned that problem right up. So we can't emphasize enough that it's all about the timing. So how do you get that timing right? 
uh, you get it from scouting. And although it's time consuming, it can have profound impacts on the success of your pest management. So there's a lot of scouting benefits. Um, it, you can find the problem before it gets out of hand. You can get action thresholds. Uh, you can identify what varieties are most prone to infestation, so you can keep an eye on those in the future. You can predict, predict timing, um, evaluate efficacy of biocontrol or pesticides, um, and it helps you determine the rates of the biocontrol agents to use also. And over time, it's going to help you evaluate the success of your aphid management program. So some of the scouting um, strategies that you can employ. Plants should be inspected regularly as time allows. All staff who handle the plants should really know what to look for, or one employee could be the designated scout. The focus for greens really needs to be in the early fall planting season. So if you gradually transition from summer to fall crops, place a lot of emphasis during that time to find the issues that will carry over into winter. If you have aphids in the fall, chances are going to be very high. They're going to become a major issue in the spring when day length gets longer if they go unnoticed. So the key really is to find them then and do something about it. Plants should be inspected systematically, like 10 plants per 100 foot of row length or two per 200 foot interval. Or you can even use like a 10 by 10 inch square per, per interval if you don't have like individual plant units. Um, if you visually divide the plants into three stratum, the outer, middle, and center, um, you can look at a couple of different leaves per section to visually inspect. So this, in theory, allows you have a representative inspection of the whole plant. Uh, it's really good to get and look inside because a lot of times aphids can hide deep within the greens and they often go unnoticed. So when you find these issues, you really want to mark these areas out with flagging of some sort. Um, so you can target that spot with um, biocontrols or spot pesticide spray or, or removal or whatever you wish to do. So one of the most important scouting tasks that we can't emphasize enough is to record observations. Some of this um, information includes how many plants are infested and what percentage of the crop. So you want to know what that infestation level is. So any sort of number estimate um, is really idea, ideal. Um, often biocontrol fails because the release rate was too low for the pest population. So this information um, is also useful for anticipating what issues might occur and when in the future. So then you can use um, this to release biocontrol agents um, preventatively. Some growers like to use sticky cards. Um, they're great for monitoring uh, winged uh, insects. They shouldn't be relied upon as a sole indicator tool for aphids, especially in newly planted greens in the fall, because at this stage, a lot of the aphids in the tunnel will be non-winged unless they flew in from outside or came from other crops left over from the summer. So this is where inspecting those individual plants are really worth the effort. Spring, on the other hand, um, when daylights get longer and more insects take flight, um, that's also a great time to use them. But these also don't work work very well uh, if you use row covers because they'll get stuck to them. So if you do use them, they kind of need to be protected in in some form. All right. So similar to get to know your aphids, it's good to be able to recognize who your friends are and when and how they attack their prey and when they will actually perform their best. All right, so sometimes the undersides of leaves can be a complete horror show, but it's not all that scary once you know who some of your friends are, um, like the salad crouton, aphid mummy, um, or those scary orange maggots that um, are fly maggots that like to eat the aphids. Um, sometimes it can be really scary to see all this stuff, but it's really not so scary once you know who the good ones are. So there's several biocontrol agents that are commercially available for use on aphids that work great during the summer, such as lace wings, parasitic wasps, uh, the predatory larva of the acetylides fly, uh, and these lady beetles. However, on winter greens, the options are quite limited unless you're providing supplemental heat. A lot of these natural enemies work well from about late March to early uh, 
or late October, early November. In the case of Aphidolides, the fly, um, this biocontrol agent actually undergoes diapause. So it kind of sleeps. It doesn't really want to work when day lengths are really short. So it needs long days. Uh, so of these options, the parasitic wasps and lady beetles are going to be your best option heading into the winter. For green peach aphid, the wasp Aphidius pulmani can be used preventatively in the fall. Um, this wasp is not affected by day length. Adults lay eggs inside the aphids, and then the larva and pupae develop inside, turning it into the mummies, uh, killing them. We call them croutons on salad greens because they kind of look like these little croutons. Uh, the adults feed on honeydews and nectars from like things like habitat plantings, like alyssum. These wasps work the best at like 50 to 76 Fahrenheit and are fairly tolerant of cool temperatures. Uh, some research from Cornell showed that fall releases combined with lady beetles and sprays of a fungal biopesticide were actually able to suppress aphid populations on tunnel greens um, until the next spring. So this wasp only parasitizes green peach aphid. Um, that's why it's important to um, know what aphid species you have. And it can also be released under row co covers. Lady beetles, uh, they should be used when you know you have aphids. They require a prey base, meaning there's if there's no food, they won't stick around. These beetles work very well in cold temperatures under row covers and are predatory both as adults and larvae. There's often shortages of them uh, because they're collected from the mountains of Northern California. Um, I hear right now they're not available um, a little bit because of the forest fire effects and also because um, they don't really collect them much until right around this time for uh, the winter beetles. But availability is coming soon. So here's um, a general timeline that I put together. So I'm, I'm a visual person um, that shows the approximate timing of the releases for aphid natural enemies kind of over the course of a whole growing season. So as I mentioned before, um, you really want to focus on scouting in the early fall and again in late winter to catch infestations before they get out of control. Um, as soon as those day lengths get a little bit longer, um, February, March, I mean, you can really start getting those wicked aphid outbreaks. But if you find them in the fall and you do something about it, like release some parasitic wasps early on, um, or find a hot spot, you could spot spray it or anticipate that you're gonna come into the spring with some sort of infestation, you could release lady beetles um, under row and put, they'll do well under, under row covers and whatnot. So then in the spring, um, you can just amp up the use of the aphidious wasps um, and the aphidolides flies will work really well going into those summer crops. And you can also supplement that with lacewing larvae uh, throughout the summer. Those can do, do really well when you get high, high numbers of prey. So a few comments on how to increase your chances of success of biocontrol. Timing is everything, I'll say it again. It takes time and effort to develop a personalized plan that's unique to your own operation. And you really need to find a supplier you like and schedule a plan in advance. And your scouting records can help you achieve this. And you really need to continue monitoring these populations and you wanna check natural enemies that you get to make sure they're viable. The grower guide link on the bottom of the screen is a great resource so you can check the quality of any natural enemies you purchase. I had some really good guidelines um, in there. Uh, habitat or banker plant systems can help boost populations as well. Uh, these provide food um, or hosts to attract natural enemies, or they can enhance the ones that have been purchased. So alyssum, for example, is a great cold tolerant plant that does well uh, along with greens until the coldest part of the winter kills it off. That can provide some supplemental food for um, aphidias. And it can also um, bring in hoverflies, zirphid flies from the outside that attack aphids. It can also promote their establishment around tunnels um, before, spring, before spring. So as more growers use heat, oh, all right, so as more growers begin to heat uh, tunnels, uh, the aphid banker plant system is something that I think has great potential for successful use in high tunnel greens or in early heated production houses. So
so this system uses um, winter wheat or barley. It's a grass. Uh, it's infested with a host-specific aphid called bird cherry oat aphids. And you release the Phidias colmani onto it, and the wasps reproduce, and they, they, then they disperse and search for green peach aphids. Um, they can be a little labor intensive because there's an upfront investment um, of time to produce them, but a lot of a few high tunnel growers are very happy with the way they work for them. And I know a lot of ornamental growers are, and they can help cut down the cost associated with um, shipping of natural enemies. So if you do choose pesticides, choose le least toxic chemistries. There's lots of options out there. We'll talk for another day. Um, I'll emphasize compatibility charts. So if you have any beneficials, it's good to check that before um, spraying anything because it completely can it can completely kill your beneficials off if you don't choose appropriately. Um, on that line, I'll mention that um, there's some strains of the insect killing fungus, Bavaria, that can be effective for aphid management. Uh, there's a few products that are um, organic listed. Uh, with these, good coverage and contact with hosts is really essential, and multiple applications are off, often recommended. So these also operate within a specific temperature and humidity range. So some research from Cornell that I mentioned earlier, they use mycotrol in, um, with greens in combination with wasps and lady beetle releases up in November, and they have really good results with this. Well, like all pesticides, be sure to read the label um, because they're not always labeled for um, particular crops. So in the last talk I did for this series, I had this slide in here. It was really fun to watch parasitic wasps attack aphids. So if anyone was really interested, I left this in here because it's a pretty cool video. And here are some additional resources about managing aphids and tunnels. And that is it. Oh, um, I want to say there will be a high tunnel virtual conference coming up. High tunnels after dark. Uh, credits will be given out for that. Um, it'll occur over three consecutive days, uh, Tuesdays um, in December. Um, details will be released about that within the next month. And that is it for this section. Take it away, Anne. Well, okay. great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, just wanted to point people out to the um, link there of the webinar series where they'll be able to see these slides and be able to access all the great resources you just provided. We have a few questions piling up. Keep them coming and we'll get to them after Anne is done. Take it away, Anne. Okay. Can you rem remind me, somebody remind me how I share my screen? How did you share your screen, Cheryl? Um, uh, Vern made you... Oh, you have to make me the host. A uh, sharer. No, you're a presenter. You should be able to do that. Um, let's uh, see. Uh, under, there's the, up next to the oh, microphone share my button. Screen. Next to the microphone button. Yep, push that. Okay. My request has been sent. It's next to audio. Where it says screen. Yeah. And I said, share my screen. And then it said, your request has been sent. You oh, can you show what to share after you're made presenter. Oh, you're the new presenter, your presenter again. Oh, OK. All right, here you go. I think I'm there. I'm getting there. OK. Great, we can see it. OK, cool. OK, great. All right, so hi, everybody. Thanks for attending. I'm going to switch gears, talk about some diseases of winter greens. It's uh, Luckily, it's been pretty warm and dry, so we haven't seen many problems yet, but there have been a few. So um, the first thing you might run into are soil-borne diseases when you're getting seedlings started, especially if it's cool, wet, cloudy. And uh, soil-borne diseases are definitely uh, uh, basically called damping off and it's a a group of four or five different soil borne fungi that attack seedlings either before they emerge from the soil or they can attack after they've emerged and they're in all soils uh, and all of these fungi like cool wet conditions so basically what we're trying to do with some of these damping off problems is just avoid the issue 
and anything you can do to promote rapid germination will help. So don't let those seeds sit in cold, wet soils, basically. Always start with clean flats. You know, disinfest the flats uh, before reusing. Using heat mats, if you're seeding in flats, is always a helpful thing. Then you don't have to worry about what the weather is outside or, or in the high tunnel. You can keep things warm and get quick germination that way. Um, and also you want to avoid overwatering, especially when it's cool or cloudy. And just remember the choice of soil mix you use uh, might affect the water holding capacity. So if you choose a mix with high organic matter, you're going to have wetter soil. So just be aware that you can choose something with a little bit less peat or less organic matter if that's been a problem for you. Um, you can always use root shield, which is a trichoderma fungus. And what this fungus does is it competes uh, with the bad guys, these bad fungi, for sites on the roots. They sort of protect the roots. So those are two uh, options you can do. So the next problem, I haven't seen too much of this yet uh, this fall, but it is a common occurrence in the fall on spinach. And it's a leaf spot disease called cladosporium. And um, it causes these really pretty small leaf spots that stay discrete and little. And, you know, when I look at that kind of leaf spot on the left, you know, it almost makes me think of something abiotic because it's got a clear delineation between the green healthy tissue and that brown dead tissue. But if you wait a few days, you'll start seeing spores form on those leaf spots. Uh, there's also another one, a lesser pathogen called Stemphilium on spinach. It has a more uh, larger, more diffuse uh, leaf spot. That's the picture on the right. Um, but we definitely see more of the cladosporium. And this fungus disease prefers cool and moist temperatures from 59 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can be active over a wide range. So it can still be active from 41 degrees up to 86 degrees. It can live in dead spinach tissue for eight years. So if you do have an outbreak of this and you're cleaning up uh, the house, get rid of all that old spinach tissue because it will uh, hang out there. So for management, it's basically trying to manage temperature and moisture. Um, you don't wanna put any row covers on wet plants uh, because that'll really exacerbate the problem. And it's, it gets tricky this time of year. I know people are you know, putting on and taking off row covers all the time, depending on the, you know, the weather and the temperatures. So, um, but it really is all about moisture management, uh, trying to keep things dry using uh, drip irrigation um, with this disease. You can bleach or hot water treat the seed because it can be uh, seed borne or, um, and so that might help a little bit. And you wanna rotate out of spinach. You don't wanna do continual spinach because it will build up over time. In the Veg Recommends, they list uh, Bacillus mycoides lifeguard as a treatment. I'm not sure how effective that is. Uh, I guess it's worth a try, but one of the best bets is to try to look for some resistant cultivars. And there is some resistance out there. So keep note of what you're trying and what, what cultivars seem to be more um, or less susceptible to the, the disease. This has a, been a problem the past few years and an increasing problem. This is spinach downy mildew, and we just had a sample of this in the clinic uh, last week um, showing up. So it's another fall disease, and the symptoms are this, uh, the yellowing on the top surface of the leaf, and then if you turn that leaf upside down, you'll see these brown purplish diagnostic spores on the leaf undersides. And they're more obvious in the early morning when it's probably higher humidity. But if you see these yellow spots on the top, but you don't see the spores, you can take some of those leaves, put them on a moist paper towel uh, and put them in the dark overnight, and then those spores should develop. So you can kind of diagnose it on your own if you want. But I'm always uh, happy to look at samples. Uh, it's really quick to 
figure out what's, you know, if downy mildew or powdery mildew is involved just by scraping the leaves and looking for the spores. So spinach downy mildew likes really cool, cloudy, wet conditions, and it can really spread fast in a field or a tunnel. It can be sort of an epidemic. And you can go from spore to infection to producing another spore within six to seven days. Um, and the reason we're seeing more of this probably is that this pathogen, like late blight uh, pathogen, they need a live host to um, so they can survive. So I think what we're doing is creating, we've created a, a green bridge, they call it, from our fall spinach in the field. And then we're planting high tunnel spinach, you know, maybe at the same time. So the, uh, the disease might be going from that fall the field spinach into the high tunnel. So anything you can do to break that green bridge by tilling under your fall spinach so you get a break uh, before you plant the, um, the high tunnel spinach is a good thing. Uh, the tricky thing about this disease, it's a fungus-like organism. There are many different races of the pathogen. And uh, every time breeders uh, breed a new resistant cultivar, you know, a new race sort of evolves. The pathogen is uh, trying to overcome this resistance. And typically there's about one new race of the fungus uh, every year. So the breeders um, in California, Arkansas are, are really busy trying to stay ahead of this, this pathogen. So again, it's like the cladosporium, all these fungus diseases, it's all about, uh, humidity and moisture management. Um, anything you can do to reduce humidity and leaf wetness will help minimize that disease. Also, the use of resistant varieties will help minimize the incidence. And like I said, there are several races of this pathogen. In the last few years, we've found um, race 14 surfacing in New England. And so you want to select uh, cultivars that have, have the most resistance. Because once infected, there's not much you can do um, to, you know, rescue the, the plants from this disease. If you have it, you want to rotate out of spinach for at least two years. Fungicides can be used um, preventatively, uh, and there are several conventional ones. Organic products, uh, there's a whole list but copper is probably considered the most effective, but that's based on very few eval evaluations. And so um, it's, you know, it's not a perfect fix. Your, your better fix is by selection of resistant cultivars. And if you are using uh, a fungicide, you wanna make sure the, um, it fits into your production schedule and days, days to harvest, things like that. So resistant cultivars, uh, you know, they're always, uh, uh, breeders are always coming up with new stuff. I know a lot of growers around here have used Corvair and that has downy mildew resistance of race one through 11, 13, 15, and 16. So it's missing the 14. So if you see downy mildew on, on your Corvair, it's probably this race 14. Shelby, um, Again, also all of those except the, except the 14. So you just wanna choose something that's you know, got the most, uh, most resistance. And this um, downy mildew that we saw last week or week before came in on kookaburra spinach uh, seed. And that also has resistance to uh, races one through 13 and 15. So, we, uh, anybody who has spinach downy mildew, we're happy to send off samples to uh, an expert in Arkansas, Jim Carell. Uh, and he's looking at the spinach that came into the clinic last week and he's gonna race type it. So we'll find out exactly which race of downy mildew we've got, whether it's a new one or is it is it that race 14. So. Basically, uh, just email me if you've got uh, downy mildew on, on your spinach, and I think we need to collect about 40 leaves, and then I can FedEx them off to um, Arkansas, and we can get a, a good handle on what races are around. 
a couple problems that uh, are not pathogenic, not infectious that we're seeing on spinach or winter greens is uh, an abiotic disorder called edema. And I've seen it on spinach. That's the picture on the left. Picture on the right is some sort of a brassica. Um, and what happens is, you know, it's tough to water this time of year because we don't know if it's going to be 70 and sunny or it could be 35 degrees out um, and cloudy. So you water the plant, take up all the water. If it's not sunny and warm, they don't transpire it so that moisture builds up in the plant cells and eventually um, ruptures and causes these blisters, typically along the leaf veins on the undersides of the leaves. So just be aware uh, that, that you may see that and the plants will grow out of it, um, but it's an abiotic uh, issue common in spinach and some of these uh, brassica plants. Another abiotic or not really a problem, but it concerns growers sometimes uh, are these glandular trichomes that uh, spinach has. And they almost, first time I looked at it, I thought, gosh, are they insect eggs? Because they were all on these little stalks, but um, it's normal. But I guess spinach tends to pr produce more of them under winter and spring conditions. So uh, just be aware that, you know, it's probably, uh, you know, it's just a, um, a normal plant uh, occurrence, but it looks kind of funky. So um, there are also some downy mildew diseases on lettuce and uh, this uh, downy mildew, it causes white powdery spores on the upper leaf surface. Again, it's cool, cloudy conditions. So um, you might see it in late season lettuce in the field or, uh, or in early season in the high tunnel. And it's this downy mildew really attacks um, older foliage first. So you see it uh, typically when the lettuce is approaching maturity. And uh, I can't really see this, but I think I said infection can, in, can occur as, in as little as three hours. Uh, when the leaves are wet. I think that's what the slide says. <laughs> Something's, uh, other stuff is covering it. Um, so it can happen really fast. Uh, it attacks older leaves first. And again, resistant cultivars are the way to go. And, but this downy mildew also has very many races of the pathogen. So um, just be aware that uh, there are lots of different races. So you want to choose a cultivar that has resistance to the most races. Uh, and you can uh, use a hot water seed treatment to minimize this disease. Also powdery mildews can be a real problem in lettuce or uh, in other crops. And powdery mildews are different from uh, downy mildews in that Powdery mildews typically like it warmer and drier, or they just like high humidity. And I think we, we saw a fair amount of powdery mildew and field stuff this summer just because of the warm, warm conditions and, and high humidity. So with powdery mildew, you see this uh, coating of white spores on the tissue can be on the upper surface or lower surface, um, under surface of the leaf. Um, these windblown spores can overwinter and uh, powdery mildews are really host specific. So something that you see attacking your lettuce is not the same powdery mildew that's attacking you, your cucurbits or your brassicas. They're all very host specific. They all like the same kind of um, uh, environmental conditions. They all like it kind of warm and dry or high humidity. So that's why you see them all at once, but they're not spreading among the different hosts. And again, these powdery mildews tend to attack as plants reach uh, maturity. We're also seeing powdery mildew on kale and other brassicas. Uh, I don't know how common this is, has been for people, but um, it is increasing. Uh, again, the white powdery coating on the foliage, and I guess on the stalks of the kale, it 
sort of causes that little um, purplish snowflake pattern on the stem. So kind of an interesting symptom. Again, usually late in the season, uh, there are lots of good organic options for powdery mildews, um, which is a good thing. And but you want to destroy the crops when when uh, when you're finished or if they're infected with this pathogen because uh, all these diseases, uh, you know, if you have a real infestation, you don't want all these spores blowing uh, into your neighbor's field. So we all need to be good stewards and and destroy infected crops as soon as as soon as possible. Um, so I'm happy to look at stuff. You can send things to the plant diagnostic clinic. I think on my uh, phone message, I give out my cell phone number. So uh, we still have funky mail. Um, so it's best if you send or drop off samples at my house. Um, I think my neighbors think I'm a drug dealer. Somebody pulled up with a bunch of cannabis plants the other day. It looked like I was doing a drug deal in my driveway. Um, but anyway, just contact me. Let me know that uh, you're sending me something and, uh, and I can uh, uh, be ready for it. And I'll also let everybody know what happens with this uh, spinach downy mildew, the race, uh, what we find for the race when we hear back from Arkansas. Um, I thought I would show one other picture that's not related to greens if we had the extra time. I went through my stuff pretty quick. So uh, this was a, I know I've dealt with various growers that have had this on their squash before. And this was a, these were pictures from the Midwest and what was happening on buttercup, squash and acorn. Um, uh, growers were seeing this foamy uh, stuff coming out of the, um, the fruit and it was like bubbling and frothing and then you cut open the um the the fruit and it's sort of rotting down below that frothy area and uh people were just nobody was sure exactly what was going on they were thinking it was a yeast that there was some sort of uh, injury there first from either squash bugs or cucumber beetles and a yeast got in there and is causing all that bubbling and foaming. Another theory was a kind of a bacterial thing, but it didn't stink. It was just uh, really frothy. So uh, it's just kind of an interesting thing, uh, kind of a stump the chumps kind of thing. But anyway, I think that's pretty much what I have. I think that's it. Oh, one other picture of powdery mildew on kale. Um, and we can open it up uh, for questions. Great, thank you both so much. Lots yeah. of excellent info. There's a couple of questions in the chat and then people could <clears throat> chime in verbally or keep typing. Melissa asks about the reasoning for the last re release mm -hmm. of a Fidelides colmana in September, Errol. Was that yeah. to get a jump on things? Well, Aphidias colmani, um, they can actually parasitize and handle aphids down through about 50 degrees. So, you know, you get those days in the fall, September into October, where you still have those temperatures. Aphidias colmani can still be effective at managing aphids. So, um, yeah, they do have a value into the fall um, until temperatures get a little bit colder. Um, they don't die a pause like the Fidelides does. So it's really it's really one strategy to use when really there aren't that many strategies out there to really use. So did, did, I, did that answer the question or no? Well, so I, in one of your slides, I believe you said that the last release date was in September um and so i'm curious we released in september and i'm interested in doing another release now we have like today there's a beautiful sunny day and my greenhouse temperatures are coming up into the 70s um will they if we do a release late in the season will they kind of hang out stay dormant and then when we have a sunny day they'll start working or does it just their effectiveness goes down so much when you have that fluctuation in temperature that it's not worth it well, I mean, that's, that's kind of a million dollar question. I don't really think anybody knows. 
Um, okay. It would be really awesome to be able to study that. But if you're getting those temperatures, yeah, they they will provide control. And I know I've seen mummies and stuff going off into even November if the temperatures are well. And you know, if you if you have any supplemental heat or if it's warmer in there too, um, yeah, they definitely can still can still do their thing. But I mean, it gets really bad when it gets down to freezing or you get those frosts, you get those, you know, 40, anything below 40 at night, you know, definitely is going to set them back. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. And Cheryl, I remember a grower hanging light bulbs to try and prevent the diapause of fiddlities. Is that a realistic yeah, strategy? That strategy, that that's an interesting one. Again, um, would be really cool to have some concrete evidence about. Um, they say that hanging those strings of uh, like LED green Christmas lights can help increase their effectiveness. Uh, green, because it doesn't you know bother the in that spectrum, it won't bother any plant growth. Um, so, as far as that's something that you would do in the spring. I don't know the value of doing that in the fall. It's it's one of those things that really hasn't been tested enough to really give any guidelines on, but they say that it works. Uh, some people swear by it. A few suppliers who vouch for that, um, they think it's great. So if it works and there's results, then by all means. I saw another question too about well maybe not so yeah does that answer that question yeah i think uh let's see hans had a question um yeah go ahead yeah just a, a quick question about um putting in winter greens at a high tunnel up now um on new ground with uh, pests potential nearby but if there's any uh proactive management recommendations on the pest front, um, given you know, spinach, kale, the winter greens going in go, and growing and holding over the winter and the tunnel just going up on new ground or just wait and see, like um, see what happens and kind of scout um, towards the spring. If you're putting the greens in now, I would scout now. What, what, aph what kind of aphids are near them? Well, I don't, I, I actually don't know the species um, given the difficulty, but um, uh, the high tunnel isn't even up yet. So it's it, it's like getting it up late um, and throwing some starts in. Um, I would do the best you can about cleaning up any debris that would have aphids that are around that, if that's something that you would yep. be open to doing. And then obviously just scout, um, yeah, you scout keep and keep an eye out for them. Because you know they they could come in, maybe they won't. Maybe it's been cold enough that it knocked them back enough outside. Um, you're just you're just not gonna know until you start looking around to see what happens. Because it's every place is different. It might not happen to you, but it could happen to somebody else or your neighbor down the road. Yep. Thanks. Vern, I'm wondering if I could ask Cheryl a non-aphid question about worms and caterpillars in the fall crops. Sure. Um, this is Melissa. I have not particularly had many problems in the past. This year, I'm noticing a lot of munching. I'm I'm not able to see. I don't see what is actually eating it, but it looks like a caterpillar of some sort. There's frass, pretty small frass that I'm finding. Um, I don't know if maybe they are just coming out at night. I've heard some other people talking about challenges with winter crops and treating potentially with Dipel not being very effective um, in the the colder months. I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations. I, I just started, we just sprayed them yesterday, but they're they're eating things really quickly, specifically the chard and parsley. Um, I'm 
Not sure. Um, covers? No, maybe. I, I'm I'm not 100% sure. I would, I'd have to give this one some thought. But and Sarah notes in the chat she's having a fall army worms. Yeah, so I was going to say that too. Fall army worms have been around. How about spinosa? Does that do a better job? Is that less, you know, cold problematic? In trust? Vern, do you know? Well, it's worth a try. I mean, it's uh, it has two modes of action, right? It's a uh, contact and a stomach poison, I believe. I mean, the BT, I guess, I mean, if they're eating it, that's part of the challenge, right? Part of the cold is if they slow down and eat less, it doesn't work. But a bigger problem probably is once they're large, it's just not as effective. It's way more powerful shortly after hatch. So um, it probably would be good to try another material. And going out at night with a flashlight is always a good idea. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Then you can know for sure what they are. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions in the last few minutes? Um, I saw a, a nice, uh, somebody from High Mowing had a strategy for the downy mildew, just tag teaming cultivars. Oh, Paul. Yeah, Paul had a, I guess, can everybody see those chat? I just I was, was basically, I, basically I, saying to mix cultivars, basically. Is that it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just suggesting that um, Space has the teens, 12, 14, and 16. Um, I think most recent years, you know, people who focused on Corvairs, tried and true, um, are getting, you know, bit by by those even races, um, most, re the, you know, the youngest races, 12, 14, and 16. And so, um, you know, I think seed companies and breeders are, are trying to make those available, those varieties available that, that have that coverage. And so then you can plant both. Um, um, and and you know you've got a little bit of diversity and you still have corvair available people love it but it if you end up with um 14 or 12 in your greenhouse then you're kind of dead in the water yeah and as far as the bridge the green bridge any idea what um kind of break is a uh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I don't. Um, I would think a, at least two weeks, but I'm kind of making that up. You know, if uh, yeah, I'm making that up. But um, you know, I wouldn't think those spores would live long. They don't live without a live host, so you know, may even be shorter than that. But um, I think you'd be safe with two weeks. The thing is, is it can blow in from long distances. So if if you've got a neighbor growing field spinach, that's that's a problem too. But yeah, well that that's my, that, that's my guess, and I'm sticking to it. All right. Seems to be everyone's <laughs> always rushing to get one crop out and the next one in. So I, I know. know. You know, yeah. even for insects, it's good to have a break, right, Cheryl? To... Absolutely. If, if you can do it, um, if not, it's just getting the issues before you, you know, put the new in, keeping things so as clean as is, possible. Don't take good care of your greenhouse tomatoes so they die early <laughs> and you'll have plenty of time before you have to hit your fall planting dates. I have a question about aphids, if I'm not cutting it too close to one here. Go ahead. So we grow a lot of Salanova in all of our tunnels. It's sort of our focus. Um, and we definitely struggle with green peach aphids. I'm the person that said that we had a bad aphid year. And you got you folks had talked a little bit about how it was like hot and dry. And we really only struggled on things that were heavily irrigated, like celery and Salanova. So that was, I, I don't know if maybe they 
congregated there because it was a cooler environment. But um, my question is, you know, we definitely have a low population of aphids right now that we're managing, um, not with biocontrols, mostly with spray at this point. Um, two questions. One, is it likely that as temperatures really fall off, we'll see that population kind of not go away, but we don't, we can stop worrying so much about it blowing up in the colder, darker days? That's my first question. Second question, as far as the spring and managing crop residue, generally we're tarping after we harvest in the tunnels and then removing, we use the paper pot, so we'll remove chains and whatever's left of crop debris in the spring would you suggest i guess my question is are we harboring aphids on that crop debris even though it's not one of their like sort of technical overwinter hosts yes um those aphids if they're there in the fall they will sit there and they kind of super cool freeze themselves they just Get it, they can tolerate really cooler, cooler temperatures. So when you know the days are warm, they warm up, they can still be in there come springtime because they'll do really, really well in there under that protected environment. So okay, so that the is the tarp making that worse is my question, I guess. So when do you tarp it in the spring or the fall? We would be tarping it after harvest, so we're generally harvesting like we're done harvesting at some point in December. We'll tarp it and then come March, we untarp it. Okay, so essentially for tarping it, then essentially killing it off anyway. We're killing the lettuce off. Is that going to deal with those aphids or are they just like living happily under a big black tarp all winter? Well, if, if the host plant's dead, then See, that's a weird question. I mean, I would assume that if the plant is dead, then the aphids have nothing to persist on. So therefore they they would die off too because there's there's no food for them. But if there's other things around like weeds, if you have weeds and all sorts of stuff around the edges, then yeah, most definitely there will still be aphids present. They're just gonna go to whatever's green if, if they can make it there. Okay. So, um, it's good to but they're not gonna have eggs. They're not gonna be able to complete that part of their life cycle on a lettuce plant? Um, I have seen eggs in high tunnels before. Okay. So I've seen aphid eggs in really high infestations, um, but then it could have flown in from somewhere else. It's, it's really, really complicated. So that's why it's good to get as much. If you know you have an infestation in the fall, I would do the best you can to get rid of the debris and get rid of whatever aphids are in there make it really clean and nice going into the spring so you can start spring as clean as possible and not have any carryover. And do you consider a tarp making it nice and clean or would you suggest pulling it all when it's green? I would pull, uh, see, if it were me, I would pull it um, and get rid of it. Uh, but if, you could do your own experiment. You can tarp it, and then you could see if any aphids come up around it. Um, see, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have the concrete answer to, to this question. Because if you tarp it, and yeah, that works for you, and you don't have any other weeds around, then it works. But if somebody else tarps, and then they have a bunch of weeds over there, they're like, oh, well, it didn't work for us because you know they had weeds over there. So. I would just be really diligent in scouting and whenever you put something else in there just to keep checking on it to make sure that there's no aphids that survive the winter that's going to go onto your crops. Great, so thank Cheryl, you. Cheryl, in a situation like that or another tunnel that's really pretty well cleaned out, but you want to know if you're starting with a population, what would be a good, you know, live plant to put out as a kind of a trap trap crop for monitoring <laughs> early oh, in the I wish we had a trap crop for aphids. Um, we haven't really found one yet that would work for aphids. Um, 
I guess I meant I just an attraction, not even trap, but to put out like transplant some early early greens before your whole crop and just wouldn't wouldn't any aphids there go to the few plants that you put out? It could. Some nice red salanova. They they love salanova, that's for sure. They seem to like yes, that a lot more than others. <laughs> other other varieties. Um you know, it's an option if you have that kind of time and effort. You know, you can always try to do that. Um, but that's a great area in need of research, and that would be really fun to study. Like, the plant. What was that? All right, well, that's a good note to end on. A whole bunch of research questions to keep Cheryl busy for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and, and Anne, thank you both so much. As I mentioned, the slides and the recording will be posted in the next day or so on the Vegetable and Berry website under webinars. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Hans Estrin will be presenting on root washing systems. So take care. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.